Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, we live by faith and not by sight. We desire to be an overcomer. We desire to let your word and spirit and your purposes include us. We desire, Father, to drink from the fountain of the spring of life. We desire light and not darkness. We desire heaven and not hell. We desire submission to your sovereignty, not submission to our sovereignty. We desire to be free from our sin and free from the lusts of the heart. And we desire, Father, to sing your praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Revelation 21, we're just looking at the first eight verses today. Are you going to spend two weeks on the next part of it? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and I have an announcement next week. I'm going to be out of town. We're going to have a guest teacher. Uh, I'm not sure who that's going to be, but they will uh, not be teaching from Revelation. It'll be a break. My uh, younger brother, he, we're almost Irish twins, but my younger brother that's just younger than me had his first child with his wife, so, and they live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So after services on Sunday, I'm going to run up to go see Don and his daughter, Lyndon. They named the child Lyndon, whether or not it was a boy or a girl, just changed the spelling. So, um, so I'll, I'll be there, and uh, we'll also, that week, not have Pilgrim's Progress study. So if you're in that study, we will have it this Friday, but not the next Friday. All right, Revelation 21. May the Father bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of His Holy Word. Then I saw a new heaven... And a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, <clears throat> It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to do a quick survey briefly into the book of Genesis, beginning with verse uh, chapter 12, if you'll flip with me. It's interesting, as I was praying on where we should go, the Lord gave me the first book of the Bible, as we're looking at the last book of the Bible. There's so much between Genesis and Revelation that are linked. Uh, for instance, the first book of the Bible has the tree of life. The last book of the Bible has the tree of life. Uh, the first has rivers, the last has rivers. The first has God dwelling with His people, the last has God dwelling with His people. And just a reminder that what we see from the first to the last is that God is telling the story where His perfect creation was, by His intention, allowed to fall into disrepair so that He could recreate it. And as Tim Keller says, only God can start with perfection and make it better. 
That's something we can't fathom. Uh, we do not want to go back to Adam and Eve's day. Because the new Jerusalem, the new earth, the resurrection of the dead is incomparably better than where we started. The first is, is the seed of the one to come. Another way to consider, uh, the, depending on your understanding of, of science and scripture, I'm not a young earther, but many of my friends are. That could be a conversation for another day. Uh, I have no reason biblically to not be a young earther. I just, carbon dating, you know, uh, <laughs> fossils. But uh, whether the earth has been around for billions of years or, or uh, 10,000 years, or however long that, that group believes, uh, is, is a little irrelevant. Uh, consider the earth, the current earth, as still in the womb. We're not even born yet. And in the womb, certain things take place, and there's pressure put on it, and there's pain. Uh, part, of the, uh, part of the matter that makes up a baby, it doesn't become the baby, but becomes a fluid or, or um, placenta or uh, something else. And, and yet some of the matter becomes a child. Part of the inworkings of the, of the child that grows and becomes a, a human. Uh, at birth is full of life and can breathe the air of the world around it. And in one way to look at that, if you use scripture from Romans and elsewhere, that the current creation is in the throes of pains of labor, that what is to come is as intimately linked uh, to what is, but better, just as a living person is as intimately linked to the living person inside the womb, but to be free from the womb is the goal. And so... This, in a, in a sense, the, the current creation and the new creation are not at odds with each other. They're related to each other just as much as your current life and your resurrected life are related to each other. But if you had to pick one, you're going to want to be resurrected. So we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 to follow a little bit of the promise of God. Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said, uh, had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Then he says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. If we flip to chapter 15. In verse 1, God says to Abram, The word of the Lord came to him in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. And then you, let's see. You go forward and you see that God will allow, verse 12, this, As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not of their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. I will punish the nations they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Yet, however, your fa you will go to your father's. He'll, he named several things about his death. Um, if we flash back, so we know that's the future of part of the people of God's, part of the future of God's people is that his descendants will suffer. Flash back to verse 4. The word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, referring to um, Ishmael. Uh, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, So shall your offspring be. So we see a general promise to God and uh, to Abraham from God in chapter 12. Getting more specific in verse 15, uh, chapter 15. Flip to verse uh, chapter 17. And he says in verse 1, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. And then Abraham fell down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, but your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish uh, 
I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of, the Canaan, of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. He goes on from there about covenant and change and, and circumcision, and Romans explains that the true circumcision is the circumcision of the heart. But we see early on in the story, the first book of the Bible, in the first third of the first book of the Bible, God has made a few promises. One is that He promised... Not only is he, did he establish a curse over the land, the woman, the serpent, the man, but in the woman he put a seed. He said the seed will come from the woman, he will crush the head of the serpent. And the whole Old Testament is the story and the tracing of that seed. That's why Matthew chapter 1 starts with the lineage of uh, Jesus Christ, tracing the seed. That's why genealogies are important. If you want to know how to read the Old Testament, go look at Matthew chapter 1 and just trace that line. Study person to person to person all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in addition to following that seed, God said to Abraham that because of God's choosing to do a work by His own mercy, as we later know, by Jesus Christ and His cross, God is going to do a great and glorious thing. He's going to create a location. He's going to pr provide a dwelling. And He's going to populate that dwelling with a blessed people that have formed into one nation from many nations, all through the promise God made to Abraham. And so when we get to, to the 21st chapter of Revelation, what we see is that Revelation is, is not a, a, a stray book that was added to the end to make us all good people and scared of heaven and hopeful for, or scared of hell, hell and hopeful for heaven. Um, it's not, uh, the, even the New Testament is not just some replacing of the Old Testament. You've got the God of the mean God of the Old Testament. We've got the loving God of the New Testament. You hear that preached in churches sometimes. That's completely false. What we see from the beginning to the end, that God has a plan and a purpose, that He will create the conditions by the cost of His own Son's blood, for the praise of His own glory. He will be surrounded by people who put their voice and tongue to the test as they sing to the glory of God, because we were once fallen from God, sinners against Christ, and we've been brought in. And people who have sinned against God and have been forgiven sing differently than people who have never sinned. This is the plan. And so we get to Revelation 21. This is the whole point. That's when God says, I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega. It is done. This has been my plan from, creation, from eternity past, before the foundation of the world, that I would fully create, allow to fall, and recreate the heavens and the earth for my dwelling among redeemed, regenerate children of God. God has decided to do this. And you all have been brought into the story. You all, and I, myself included, have been brought in through the grace of God to fulfill His desire. And so, let's see what that looks like. I've written also in our, our second uh, bullet here that the Older Testament is known as the shadow of the New, which is the fulfilled and actual testament and covenant. Um, when Abraham stood over the land and he heard all the phrases, uh, this is how many of the descendants will be. There will be a dwelling place here. I'll give you all this land. It will become a land of flowing with milk and honey and all this stuff. And then, and then the people after him, the people after him kept getting glimpses of that. We have a tendency to believe that what Abraham was hearing and seeing from God was a city built by men, ruled by King David, where the high priest was Zadok and the prophet was Nathan. And that they would kick out the Philistines. And they would establish a righteous throne, secular righteous throne, where they could rule, like the Romans rule, but it's just them doing the ruling and not the Romans. No different. They're not any more righteous. They're just, we won, you lost, we're better. And I believe fully that when Abraham was taken up in the Spirit and shown these great things, and God gave him the trance and a vision, what Abraham was actually seeing was not the Jerusalem that was won over by David and reconstituted and the temple was built by Solomon. He was seeing the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. He was seeing the resurrection of the dead. He was seeing things that he didn't have the words to describe to a people who didn't even know the name of God because he didn't have his name either. That was not until Moses. He didn't know that God was Trinitarian yet. He didn't have the language for that. But Abraham led and laid down his life 
and, and uh, was willing to, to, to trust God and to be credited as righteousness because he saw God's purpose beyond words. And the people over time were shown God's hand without full revelation. They saw the cloud of fire by day and, and uh, by night and cloud by day. They saw all these things, but we know the cloud's name. His name's Jesus. They were fed manna in the wilderness. They, they, know, they know the stories. We know the name of the, the bread of life. His name's Jesus. They had the serpent on the pole. That them, though they were bitten by vipers, they could live because they looked at the serpent. We know his name is Jesus. John 3, 14. Right before John 3, 16. The Son of Man must be lifted up so that all who believe on his name shall not perish in their sins but have eternal life. All these things are built up in the Old Testament. They're fulfilled in the New Testament. Every single word God has spoken will come to pass through Jesus Christ for our benefit. And so we see three things happen up front. The final judgment's taken place. The consummation's here. God is getting what He's been planning from the beginning of time, and that's a new heaven and a new earth. It's hard to describe what a new heaven and a new earth will be like. We do know they're linked to this one. Uh, if you look at uh, Isaiah, there's also parts of Romans. This is, a, this is more of a transformed earth. It will, it will be like earth. Uh, as it's, more going, it's going to be more like earth than less like earth. It'll just be earth without pain. Earth without problems. Uh, so there'll be gravity. Uh, there'll be space. You know, you'll occupy space. We'll bump into each other. The problem is we won't fight about it. Um, <laughs> You'll be you'll be in an exist you'll be, you'll exist in actual space. Why will there be a wall? That's the next part. Of yeah, the we'll story. get to that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to ask you that question again then. Yeah. I mean, that's part of my not understanding. If it's open and it's perfect and it's free, why would there be a wall? Yeah, for some reason. Okay. We'll, we'll we'll look at that. But there'll be we do know that that the new created earth is. Is uh, the things we see in the book of Revelation 21-22 are incomparable to what we know, but they're, they are not inconceivable. You can actually conceive of these things, otherwise we wouldn't be taught to think about them. You will be in a body, but it will be incomparably better than the one you have. Uh, you will not be bound to time, in that you're, you're, there's no time ticking. You know, the, you know the ticking of time? Yeah. Tick, talk. And you think, teach me to number my days. Well, in the heaven, you don't have to number your days. Uh, your days are, you're, you're no longer a creature of time. So that's hard to, to, to comprehend. Uh, but what this means is that we won't be floating around as spirits. Or, or uh, we also won't be assumed into God. God is not a big ball of energy that has sent out little balls of energy into the world. And when we die, we just return to the big ball of energy. We don't have a personality. <laughs> you hear that in some of these Enlightenment, uh, New Agey... Uh, yeah whatever's uh, no you you are a person um, you will you will dwell on this earth you will be limited to its physical rules uh, it's a funny to me uh, are y'all aware that, that the, the Holy Church is the one who invented science the study it was through the Roman Catholic Church that the modern scientific methods were created there, there used to not be a war between science and... and so the, 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 the church was, was uh, helped fund and create universities and studies so that we could, we could look at creation and see the fingerprints of God. There was no war. Uh, God made everything. What are we afraid of? We saw quantum mechanics as the teaching that all things are ordered quantized. There, there's, a, there's a certain um, uh, constant, uh, something times 10 to the negative, 30, negative 33 electron volts. A tiny, tiny piece that's constant. Every single atom that makes up every single part of creation and every single person, desk, Bible, whatever you're looking at, is a whole number multiple of that one constant. It's like God has a, God has a, a storeroom he says, well, I need, I need more skins. And he just goes, gets, that takes uh, exactly one thousands of those. So he, he gets the constant multiple. Everything is perfectly ordered, perfectly quantized, uh, quantified. He, he has a plan. He has a purpose. And so in, current, in the current world, you don't see people debating whether a force called gravity exists or not. <laughs> 
We don't debate whether uh, death comes to all living things. We don't, we don't debate what happens to uh, a mortal body, whether an animal or a human, after so much time we become dirt. We, we don't debate these things because it's just the rules. That's God's world. And that's the world to come. We will be bound by rules, but there'll be different rules because God says the old order has passed away and the new order, order has come. And so there's no difference between your religious observance and the rules of life. We try to do that right now. Is, is we have your church life and you got the real world. I, I get this from Jim all the time. Well, Paul, in the real world, you know, you got to... I'm, I'm thinking... What the, the heck is this if this is not the real world? This is not the real word of God. I don't know. But, but right now the problem is, is that we're living in, we're living in an in-between stage where, where you know, 90% of the things that are to come we believe by faith. We believe. We don't know what, what it's like to be a creature that lives in a body but is not controlled by time. We don't know that you know, the everlasting means endless time. Eternal means no time. Eternal is where we're going, where you step outside of time. There's no time. It's irrelevant. Do you know what it's like to have no time? No. I don't know what that's like. We have no idea. That's why we sing world without end. Amen. Amen. So, just as we go through these things, this is intended to make the church joyfully reflect that our, our new natural habitat is coming. It's on the way. And God is making you ready and me ready for that. We also see a new Jerusalem um, and a new nation. Uh, for some reason, there's no sea. You notice that? That seems to be an important detail. So there's no sea. So that's, that, uh, I was telling Carla, that's like our, the separation. There's no separation, right? By the sea. Yeah, there's no continents. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, terra is the word for ground. It's all ground. Right. There is water, but it's all fresh water right. that's bound by the bound by the land. No longer the land bound by the the sea. Right. Uh, well, we'll, some of us are doing a Bible study, David Jeremiah, mm -hmm. on the mysteries of heaven. Yes. And I would encourage people to read that because that kind of talks about a lot of this that we're talking about right now. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. I hope I don't say anything wrong. It says that the sea is salty, and we will there will There's not no be a need for salt for preservation. Preservation. Okay. Cool. I'll warn you real quick on my, my books about heaven. The the logic behind it don't trace it too far. Yeah. I've noticed between I get I'm getting a nod from Ben right now, another pastor. I don't think we'll actually know why there won't be any C. Uh, but I think the point is there are going to be certain things about the new creation to come. Like we can imagine a C because we have one here. We can imagine the world without the C, but we can't quite imagine why. But there is going to be, according to this, there will be water for, for drinking. But there won't be any um, any vast oceans. You know, another another example. I mean, when you look at the water, beyond logic, if you go to look at the the place of the sea in the Bible, the sea was always for destruction. It was a place where you got food. There were a lot of fishermen. Uh, but what are some of the things what, that we know about the ocean from the Bible? What are some of the stories? Storms. The, the flood. What about Jonah? Uh, there was a, in the Jewish world, and it may have been existing at this point, there was a belief that um, when, if you fell below the sea, you were in a place where God was not able to help you. It was the one part of creation that was, it, the sea was known for chaos. And so that's why God bound the sea to certain borders. But if you dare to go onto the sea, if you go to chapter uh, 20, we see in all the places where the dead were giving up people, one of them is the sea. Death and Hades. And so the sea was seen as this, it's almost like sin. It's a, ne it's a, it's an un a not quite understood necessary part of the current creation, but it's not good. 
So it's a, I think that's just a massive theological realm. But we won't have the sea, so we won't have uh, jellyfish. <laughs> All right, so the holy city, he sees a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, dressed as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Um, just a couple notes in comparison to the current Jerusalem. This Jerusalem is not built by men. This Jerusalem is given by God. Um, reminder that, the, and you'll hear modern day preaching like this, they'll say, we need to go and build the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is never built. It's always inherited. It's given. All the par so that, that's the real social justice part. Um, now, witnessing for Christ and helping people is part of the commission, but uh, if we go back to the millennium from last week, it's, it's loosely played off the idea that we can actually, if we work hard enough, and with God's blessing, we can create a just society. And that if you've been with us this entire study, we realize that's not what happens is that the world doesn't become a just society. The world falls into further uh, vileness and further sin so that Christ Jesus returns and recreates the heaven and the earth. But the holy city, the dwelling of God, comes down from heaven, prepared, holy, beautiful, a city you've never seen before. So here's another example, like the new earth. We know what a city is, but we don't know what this city is. We don't... We, don't, we have a hard time comprehending what it's like to have a, a place with, with homes and streets and economy and it just, you know, you're, if you don't think about it very often, but uh, remember when uh, uh, Katrina came through and, and flooded New Orleans? Oh, yeah. The grief mm -hmm. that people had because they're not just from, they're not just born, they're not just from the United States, they're not just from Louisiana, they're from, they're from New Orleans. Uh, I, we have uh, family friends who fled uh, Cuba a long time ago. They're much older than me, but they, uh, they can't ever go back. They can't, Havana's not their home. And so you, I don't think we have an understanding how uh, deeply connected we are to our city, to Lubbock, or to Dallas, or if you're an Astros fan, to Houston. <laughs> uh, but... but so we know what it's like to have a dwelling. We know what it's like to identify with that dwelling. That's where I rest. That's where I get my mail. That's where I identify. That's where my friends are and my family is. And so this God is providing you the name of your new location. You will live in a city called Jerusalem. So it comes down from heaven. It's all prepared for its great wedding day. And the city drops and then God speaks. God says, now the throne, the voice coming from the throne assumes this is God, uh, says, now the dwelling of God is with men. He says, God will dwell with humans and will live with them. Number two, God, uh, they will be God's people and he will be with them as their God. And then he writes, uh, he will remove their grief and abolish death, mourning, crying, and pain, for those things are of the old order. All things uh, are, the, for the old order of things is passing away. So, go back to Abraham, where the promises were being made, the, the, uh, the, the forecasting or the foreshadowing of what's to come is being sown into Scripture. We're reading it. Sometimes you read this as a child and you don't quite understand how this is connected, but then you start to see that what God promised to do, He's doing. This is a future vision of what God will actually do, that God will dwell once again with people. He will remove any grief we have, and He will, uh, he will make it clear that whatever it was that you had grown accustomed to from the old order is completely gone and you're not to worry with that anymore. There's another example. We know what it's like to be afraid. We know what it's like to have anxiety and to grieve. We don't know what it's like to be completely free of that. 
we've had times of comparative joy, comparative freedom from fear and grief, but um, some examples would be, uh, uh, you gotta be careful with special revelation, but with anybody you've met that's, that's experienced an, uh, uh, an out-of-body experience where they've, they've died and, and been restored to their body temporarily, um, I know there's one of you in the room that has had that happen. My, my grandmother is one of these people that, that uh, had that happen to her. And she was very upset with the people who revived her. Uh, she's been wanting to die for 15 years. So that's always, it always makes family reunions awkward. <laughs> she has explicitly asked me to not pray for long life for her. She, uh, because she said... Though you're conscious, you're not asleep, you see. And you can see things that people don't think you can see. You're able to experience this world with zero anxiety. You care, even. You care. Like you, you love people, you care. But she said a, a baby sleeping, a, a, a three-month-old baby sleeping in its crib had more stress than I had. Yeah. Yeah. She, she said, you don't, uh, I've said this to college students, they don't realize what kind of stress they're under until they're done. Yeah, that's true. And then you're done and all of a sudden, I, I, I find the, the real, real world is much less judgmental. You, you just go out and do your job. But in the same way, I don't, she said, Paul, we don't understand what kind of weight we carry even when we sleep. At our best moments, we don't realize how burdened we are until those burdens are gone. And... Uh, so God will do this. He will, you're not allowed to cry. But also remember, on this side of the grave, you have an ability that you don't have in heaven, and that's to cry. You see, in the Psalter, God, surely you have counted my tears and recorded them in your book. So crying's not bad. It's just for this order. You won't be able to in the next order. You also, it looks like you won't be able to live by faith because you'll be living by sight. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, all these things pass away uh, except these three, or maybe this one. I, don't, I need to study it better. But we know that certain things that we do now, we won't be doing in the kingdom of God. Um, so in the current order, cry. But cry to Jesus. Grieve, but grieve with Christ. Um, you'll experience pain. We've got members, dear members of our church that are experiencing pain right now in the hospital. Experience it with Christ. Because one day you won't have any pain. And you won't have any tears. You won't have any, um, any marks of the old order. So he does make it clear that once this happens, the old order of things has passed away. There's certain things that we, what we do now that you... Uh, aren't allowed to do, and you'll be incapable of doing, so you're not allowed to do it because it's, it's over, and he will wipe away your tears. So he's making, that sounds nice, doesn't it? But he's also saying, no, 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 no crying in my kingdom. Uh, so he'll take care of that. And then he, and then the voice in verse 5, who is seated on the throne said, now in Greek, it's, I make all things new. In my version, it's made it, uh, Active. I'm making all things new. What does your say? Am making. It's the same point, but I think when you read it in the Greek, it's it's kind of like saying uh, Yahweh. I am. I am who I will be. I I was I was me yesterday. I was I will be me tomorrow. In this case, I think what he's saying is to the reader, this is what I do. I make all things new. That has to do with your hope. That's my character. And then one day, you'll ask him, what are you doing? He says, I'm currently making all things new. Because there'll be an actual moment when he recreates the heavens and the earth. But his character is to make all things new. Then he says, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to say before in reading the Bible. Write these things down, for they are trustworthy and true. What he's saying is, Remember what I'm saying, write it down, share it, because this is the truth about the way things are. This is not a, this is not a Pollyanna, uh, pie-in-the-sky dream. This is the Word of God. 
It's not very often. Now, every, every scripture is God-breathed and is helpful for rebuke and correction and, and all for the growing of the men of God, the man of God. But uh, in this case, for him to explicitly say, these words are trustworthy and true, means that if you're going to hang your hat on anything today, it ought to be that God is making all things new or God makes all things new. Then he says, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What he's saying is that my plan from the beginning is completed. This has been my plan to do this. Again, God was absolutely fine in and of himself. The Holy Trinity was functioning apart from creation before time, which means a trillion years can't compare. And the Father has a love for his Son, and the Holy Spirit is that love. And God, through His Son, decided, and with His Son, to do something new, which was to create the heavens and the earth. From the Son's perspective, God, the, Father, the Son would receive a gift of love, which is the bride of Christ, the Holy Church. So Christ would receive a people that He would get to lay His own life down for. Uh, we see that uh, it would please God to crush the object of His affection for a greater gain. We're about to study the book of Job, which I believe is a Christological book about a man who was in complete glory and wealth that was undone by God, only to be restored three times or seven times or however much. is uh, That's Jesus. It also is us if we'll submit to God, but it's Jesus primarily. We see, we see before creation of the world, God ordained for the good of His Son, for the good of His Spirit, for the good of Himself, that He would have a, a place on earth to magnify His own name. And so He made all this earth, and then He let it fall into disrepair and into sin. He let His Son, Jesus Christ, be drawn, uh, or to, to die on the cross. He's, he's letting people be drawn to the gospel. He's letting people come to Him, be cleansed of their sins, be marked in the book of life, be prepared for the resurrection. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was completely fine Completely, but for the sake of their own name, they decided to make this earth and recreate it so they'll stand in the middle of it and hear an echo of praise coming back to them. The greatest thing about heaven is God's praise. The greatest thing about heaven is God's glory. And nobody will be there that doesn't see it that way. If the greatest thing about heaven is your glory or your comfort, or your vengeance, you're heading for hell. Because the, the attitude of heaven is that God will be praised. Psalm 34 puts it like this, I magnify the Lord. Come magnify Him with me. That's the point. It's, it's all about the praise of the Father. It's the old hymns. That's why modern hymns kind of bother me, unless they're decent, which are very few. But, oh, for a thousand tongues. Uh, holy, holy, holy. Uh, these old hymns that, are, that revolve around the... If it, it, if it involves our perspective at all, it's rock of ages. <laughs> I don't have... I, think, I can't believe I've been led in to this. Uh, a buddy of mine drove down to Houston last, uh, yesterday, paid $1,500 for a ticket. I said, you know, it's going to be on TV. <laughs> but, you know, he wanted to be there. He was willing to pay $1,500 to be there. Are you willing to lay down everything to be here? And remember, Jesus Christ, by the Father's design, is creating an entire new person, a new nation with new nature so that we are able to celebrate without being the, being the ones being celebrated. That's hard. I don't, you know, you go to these award ceremonies, I, I'm sure they've gotten more and more each year. By the time I was in high school, you know, we had them all the time, and you'd go to these, but if you were not up for an award, did you pay attention? <laughs> Think about it. Yeah, teenage girls. But if, if it had nothing to do with you, why you pay, why you, and that's why you got people with bad behavior in the back of the room. They have no hope of receiving an award. Why? Well, I guess it's better than calculus, but I mean, you know, <laughs> or, or I mean, it's the same reason pep rallies aren't. I mean, nobody goes to pep rallies anymore in high school. They're just, if they're if they're optional, no one goes. I'd rather go home. You know, I'm not the one on the court. Nobody's cheering for me. 
And, and that's just human nature is, is beyond loyalty and etiquette. If we're not the ones being celebrated, we don't celebrate very well. But over time, God has created and redeemed and, and, and put a holiness and a desire in our heart. So uh, Arlano asked me the other day, what's, what's the one hope above all promises that you have? And I said, God will be glorified. That was not me 10 years ago. But every year, through dark times, through difficult times, God has beat me down so that the greatest thing that could happen to me is that Jesus Christ returns and every knee bows to Him. That's what He does to us. And if that's true to you, that's a sign of your assurance and salvation that God's glory and your good have become the same thing. That you've been taken up. That your hope is to be in a place a trillion times better and bigger than Minute Maid Park. And you're going to be there and singing to the praise of the glory of Christ. Now Christ, or the Father says here, <clears throat> this is my plan and it's done. It's finished. To him who's thirsty, I will give to drink without cost the water of life. Thirsty, uh, who, the word whoever here is similar to the word you see in John 3.16. Whosoever believeth in him. That means anyone from anywhere. Anyone who thirsts. Thirst literally translates to desire earnestly. We normally put that literally with drink. And this is the example we have here. But what the Father is saying is anyone who really wants what I give, I'll give it to him. That's good and bad. Because you know your greatest problem is how little you want him or how great you want Him, or how that needs to grow, or how you need revival in your own life and own heart. But God is willing to give you whatever you want. He'll give you the desires of your heart. If that's sinful, idolatrous, we see what happens to them. You'll get those things in hell. Or, if you want Him, you'll get those things. But we see that anybody who wants... Uh, Jesus puts it this way. Whatever you seek, you find. Whatever door you knock on, it opens. Whatever you ask for, you get. And so, in this case, the only condition is desire. He says, I will give of the spring of the water of life freely. Which means there's no cost of works. There's no payment. You don't need to absorb a punishment. I won't punish you to enter the kingdom. You just have only one thing, and that's to want to be in my presence. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. Is that true? Or is that just a song we sing? That's the question every person is going to be asked in the heart of their hearts, the holiest of their holies. What do you want? I counsel people often, and, and it gets down to that question. Uh, you know, if they're fighting with somebody, uh, uh, maybe one of their relatives, I ask, well, what do you want? If you could snap your fingers and everything, maybe it takes a process of four or five years, what, what, what would you want? And some people don't really think about that. Because normally, it's more pure if you ask the question. I, I want a good relationship with that person that I used to have a good relationship with. Okay. If that's what you want, that means you're both changing. Some people say, if, if they're at their worst. Now, this is if they're in a good mood. If they're spiritually dripping with the Holy Spirit. But if they're mad, they say, I want what's right. I want them to apologize to me. I want them to admit they're wrong. That, ultimately, that's not what you want. Because what, you say you got that. What does that do to you? Like, oh, great, now they know they're wrong. You still feel rotten. What do you want? You want peace. Jesus Christ has come from the Father to be the Prince of Peace to the human race. He did not come to bring communal peace on the earth. He, formally, he mostly came to bring peace between individuals and the Father. A regenerate inheritance so that you become part of His eternal people. He's, he's providing that peace to all who call on His name. And then you're offered peace between other believers. 
But if you ask the question, what do you want? It's like your core, what's your whole being want? In the next five years, next ten years, and in eternity, what do you want? If you really get down to it, it has something to do with peace. Grace, love. And so what Jesus, or what the Father is saying here is, is that if you want to be with me, you'll be with me. There's not a single person in hell that wants to be in heaven. Martin Luther put it this way, a sinner, an unrepentant, unregenerate sinner would rather climb the gates and get out than remain in the glory of God. The biggest problem we face is our heart. What the heart wants, the will accomplishes, the mind justifies. We come to Christ freely because our heart's been changed by His grace. We go to idols freely. Freely. You run to them. I don't have to make you. You know, why, why do you sin? Because you love it. You love it. I don't have to tell you. You need to gossip more. You need to, you need to have negative thoughts. You need to, you need to be selfish. I'm just, you love it. That's what, that's what your heart wants. And, and so what God offers is regenerate hearts, changed hearts, so that you want to be with God. The fact that you want to be in heaven, the heaven of Christ, not a heaven you make up where you're just floating around like a cloud and eating marshmallows and playing his harp. But <laughs> you want heaven, which is centered around the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you will be praising God, and you will be living sinlessly, and you will submit to Him with joy. If the fact that you want those things is the work of grace in your life. Because you didn't start like that. You've only grown. Verse 7. He who overcomes, which has been the whole question of the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 are the, the seven churches, and it always ends with you who overcome. So the question is, will we? This whole book's written to ask, is God going to have a church? And by His grace, the answer is yes. But he who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God, and he will be my son. So all who overcome will inherit this habitat. You'll get all the benefits of this habitat because God is, this enthroned one is your God. <clears throat> I've heard people say, um, you need to make Jesus your Lord. Um, no, He is Lord. Don't make Him Lord. Uh, to <laughs> I, I've decided today to make Trump my president. Like, he is the president. Whether or not you agree, I mean, it's beyond the point. Uh, in the same way, in this case, God is God. He's God. He's the Lord of all things. He, and if God's not sovereign, God's not God. I mean, God, you don't have an option. <laughs> Just like you don't have an option of whether, you're not, whether or not you require oxygen to live. You don't have an option to whether or not you're born under the watchful, heartfelt care of God. But in this case, what this means isn't that you're making Him God. Your, or your God, you're now living according to what's true, and you're doing it more knowingly and joyfully than you ever have before. This is where Adam and Eve do help a little bit. When we look at Adam and Eve walking with God, and we immediately think, how do you walk with God? How tall is he? How fast does he walk? I mean, what does it mean to walk with, like physically to walk with God? What does that mean? And that's another sign to say, though God is God, and though you have faith in an invisible God, one day you will know as you are fully known. And what this is saying is, number one, is that if you overcome by faith in Christ, you will be living for the first time completely. Because you were not designed to live as your own self-sovereign free-willed person. You were designed to live under the watchful, physical, glorious presence 
of an almighty God that you can hear his voice and smell his fragrance and see his face and tremble before him and constantly. The presence of God brings out the best in you just like the presence of the sun brings out the best in a flower. And so God says, if you overcome, you'll inherit all of this for I will be your God and you will be my son. Son translates descendant. Uh, you will be, and this is, got to be real careful, of my essence. So the resurrection doesn't turn us, and it, I, there's a lot of scripture uh, misquoted, I think, about we become gods. I don't know how the resurrection works. That's one of those things we have to apprehend without comprehending it. But there will be part of us, because Christ was made into human form and was ascended into the glory of the Trinity so that our flesh was rent and the Holy Spirit could... We, the flesh has been introduced into the Trinity through, the, through Christ because the Word became flesh and Jesus will return in a resurrected body. Somehow we are marked to have a, 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 a reflection of God's own divinity. We aren't God. We submit to God, but we will for the first time truly, unflinchingly, unscathed, be made in the image of God. We will reflect His own nature. It's as if God is entrusting us to have all the elements of His virtue and glory, but we have no freedom to use it apart from His sovereignty. One of the strangest encounters of heaven will be between you and yourself. Because you'll look in your heart and you'll see no more sin. You'll see holiness. You're perfectly holy. Because you have become His descendant. Now remember, God only has one begotten Son. Christ. That's the difference. We aren't Christ. We are not begotten. We are adopted by regeneration. C.S. Lewis again puts it this way. A bird begets a bird. A bird creates a nest. I can beget my two sons and my daughter. I can create a statue. There's a wild difference between begotten and created. To call God Son, Jesus, His only begotten Son, means that in the truest sense, his, he, Christ is the Father's only natural child. The rest of us are grafted in. Through a process, one that costs the blood of the only begotten, so that we could share in His perfection, not because we were born that way, or not because we deserve it, but because God has a glorious plan to be merciful to mud creatures like us that are destined for rebellion if it's not for His grace. And so the, the concept of the power and the miracle of regeneration, that's why conversion is not a decision you make. Re regeneration is not a virtue change or trying. When people ask, and I say, are, are you a believer? I try to be. <laughs> it's like me asking someone, are you born? I try to be. He is or you ain't, man. You might, you might be broken. You might be trying. You, I get all that. Like You're not perfectly, but, but it's a yes or no question. And so, <clears throat> for us in the inheritance of heaven, to have God be God and to us be us is to share in His glory when we deserve hell. So, we're, we're not just forgiven... And then left alone, we're forgiven and imputed with the same glory that comes by faith that was imputed by Christ's cross to us. It's unbelievable. And that, that's, this is another thing, kind of like the no sea and the, the new creation of the new heavens and the earth. We're not going to quite understand, but you and I need to anticipate our resurrection. Go home and light a candle looking at, go home look at a picture of Jesus coming out of the tomb with his new body and you light a candle and say, me too. 
not by might nor by sword, but by His Spirit. I will be resurrected. You're going to see again. You're going to breathe again. You're going to walk again. All of our loved ones who have gone to sleep in Christ are going to do the same. So that's for the first group. The second group, <clears throat> it's a little different. <clears throat> the cowardly. So the, the cowardly is most often defined as man-pleasers, uh, not servants for Christ. John Piper puts it this way from Galatians chapter, chapter 1. If I were not a slave to Christ, then I, uh, if, I was, if I was worried about what people thought, I would no longer be a slave to Christ. And so what his point is, if everything a, a preacher, and he's talking about preachers, and you use your own life, but every, if everything you do, you're always peripherally looking and wondering, what are the elders going to think? Or what are the, what's Facebook going to say? Or Twitter? What, you know, what, you're always, you're always kind of adjusting and moved by what people think. You need to be held accountable, especially to the Bible, but, in, but if you're constantly trying to look at that, you will not be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. You'll be a coward. So one thing the gospel does is, under the sovereignty of God, is take people like us and take out our man-pleasing muscle. So you just don't care. Yeah. But it's not like you don't care at all because you fear the Lord. Who's a much harder person to please. So what if I stand... And I drive home from... Y'all don't know this, but I get in my car almost every sermon and cry out to God. Even though y'all pat me on the back and say, great, great job, I'm crying out to God because... It, I didn't ask, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in the congregation site. Because <laughs> he's messing with me the whole ride home. He said, you didn't say this. <laughs> you shouldn't have said that. It's hard. When, you, when you're no longer a man pleaser, it doesn't mean that you're now free. <laughs> you're now under the watchful, caring, judging, loving eye of the Father. But cowards choose to run from God's judgment and rather be judged kindly by the light of other sinners. Pull up a bar stool. Drink with us. Uh, unbelieving. He says you got cowards, you got the unbelieving. The unbelievers are um, people who, who have no trust in God. They're without trust. Uh, vile uh, is the other word for abominable. Uh, the word abomination, which literally translates foul or stinky. So God's perspective of an abominable person or abominable act is that that's a rotting smell. Uh, murderers, uh, sexually immoral. Literally, this means male prostitutes. If, if you've noticed much of the teaching in the, in the Bible about uh, sexual immorality uh, is geared specifically at men. I don't know if that's a, an intended thing, but, but uh, the women seem to, they're also called, but the, this, the, the men are being taught, don't get caught up with a prostitute. Or he, he's not, he doesn't go after the female prostitutes, he goes after the men. And uh, you don't have to study uh, psychology too much that, to know that men seem to have an exceptionally hard problem with lust uh, and sexual immorality, although that has to do with everybody. But uh, this does, uh, male prostitutes would obviously include homosexuality. Um, and using your body, um, the body God gave you, for sexual gratification in ungodly ways. I've got to say one thing real quick just about that regarding the scriptures. There are several things that Christ absorbs by his cross and are fulfilled by him and not by us. Being sexually pure is not one of them. Christ was sexually pure, but he also, the Bible, if, when you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament has things the New Testament doesn't have. Kosher laws, right? There's certain things that don't translate over, but being sexually pure does translate over. Did you notice that? The epistles are replete with information about watch yourselves, watch, watch your bodies, watch that sin. That's a, that's a grievous sin. Um, I think there's a reason for that. And in the modern world, the modern church, and I still have debates with people, <clears throat> when I know people who are uh, purporting to be Christian teachers and Bible teachers that are wholeheartedly not just supportive of sexual immorality, but advocates to celebrate it, my one question to them is, would you be willing to have a conversation with all of the Christian leaders in the southern and eastern hemispheres 
who 100% disagree with you. These are saints that are being jailed for the faith, being beheaded for Christ. They completely disagree with you that, that the sexual revolution is a good thing. They think it's not a good thing. So can you, can you have a conversation with them? And I want you to be willing to tell them that you're right and they're wrong and that your beliefs are biblically derived and not culturally conditioned. I don't think you can. This is a warning. Those who practice sexual immorality do it willfully and consistently, never grieving, never fighting, never clinging to Christ to conquer this. That is a dangerous thing. Even if you're baptized, even if you confess Christ, Paul writes several letters about this issue. This has got to be said. This is not to reject people. This is not to be mean to people. I pastor people from all different walks of life. But it is not loving to tell somebody, uh, th take the transgender deal, it is not loving to tell somebody who's doing something that mutilating your body is good. That's not love. Love is loving somebody and holding them and being with them and walking with them and struggling with them and saying, I don't understand, just like they don't understand my struggles. But I love you. And I love Christ. Let's be with Christ together. But don't ask me to advocate for things that are unbiblical. This is... Uh, I'm done on that. I hope that's clear. I, I can't believe I have to say this, but this is the world we live in. Every single person is welcome to draw near to the gospel. But do not have us change the gospel for you. We also have a witchcraft, which we, I don't want to get into that today, but that's an actual thing. Uh, idolaters are those who are false god devotees. So they uh, not only have false religions, which are the idolatry of it's worshiping anything that's created, but being devoted to those things. We all, have, we all have the problem of idolatry in our heart because we're sinners. Uh, a buddy of mine, when, when on Facebook, when you name... Can I have five more minutes? Sure. Yeah. What are you going to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> so when you have... He was just joking, I hope. But they have religious preference or religious whatever. And mine's you know, Protestant Christian. And he put, uh, what's your religion? The almighty dollar. Just to, I think to be funny. But... Uh, the fact that we're all swayed by, by the Calvin calls the human heart an idol-making factory. That we're con that's why we constantly need to confess our sins and hallow God above our idols for help. But this is a person who, who never repents, who will defend their position and their false God to death. Uh, they don't doubt it. They don't doubt that money will make them happy. They don't doubt that sex will make them happy. They don't doubt that power will make them happy and peaceful. And so that's the route they're on. That's the road that leads to destruction as well, is to be a devotee to a false god. Uh, and then finally, liars, which is... Uh, and the Greek I found is, is untrue people. Um, it's, it includes... Uh, to me, this is particularly folks who purport to be Christian and aren't. When Jesus says on that final day, I never knew you, um, it's the phonies, it's the fakers that are, that are uh, told in Scripture multiple times will be in the church. There will be wolves and there will be fakes uh, in addition to goats or to sheep. Uh, there's that parable, the weeds and the wheat, they must grow up together. God will tolerate weeds living among the wheat for some purpose uh, that's glorious to him. Uh, but that would be the liars, the, the people who are amidst the church that are faking it. All right, so they're consigned to hell. Uh, uh, consigned should be to hell. Uh, they get no share in God's blessing. All right, so here's our three takeaways. Number one, reflect on God's promises to himself and reveal to his vessels that he would have all the conditions met for the praise of his glory by countless tongues. It's like gravity. This is the truth. This is what's going to happen. Uh, the Titanic sinking wasn't a matter of interpretation. <laughs> it's a matter of fact. 
your inability to repent was the problem. It's a fact. Repent and live accordingly, or don't repent and live to your damnation, or die to your damnation. So, ref spend time reflecting. A lot of the praise and worship of God is regarding the consummation. Um, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Uh, ends with the line, victors in the midst of strife. We're currently living through the strife, but we're already marked as victors. So in, especially in your, your personal prayer life and in your corporate life and in your local church, when you praise God in the sanctuary of the Almighty, you're praising Him according to the new order. You're coming, you're coming and trusting the covering of the blood of Jesus. Marvel at the blood of Jesus. Marvel at the gospel. That's what the sacrament's for. But then use that position of strength to glorify God by praising His name and to glorify God in your personal walk by conquering sin in your life and sharing the gospel. Reflect on these things. Start living according to the new order, not the old order. Uh, number two, thirst. Uh, desire earnestly the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Say repeatedly, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. So much about Christ and Christianity is about desire. If your desire is not there, note that. Have your heart, your heart will cry out according to the Psalms. The, your heart will cry to your soul and to your mind, what's wrong with you? Get to holy things. Ask God to set your heart aflame again. Get to sacrament. Get to church. Get to Bible study. Get to your prayer closet. Crank up the tunes. Whatever you have to do, if your desire is not where it needs to be, come to Christ. Beg Him for help because He deserves to have a people who want Him more than they want anything else. That's what revival is. Lastly, take heart for your inheritance is already secure. So serve God, win souls, and celebrate the gospel. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, as we re remain in the purposes and covenant that you shared with yourself and that you revealed when you chose to your servant Abraham and later recalled it down the line until the angels harked that the Christ, the seed which was promised, had been born, the begotten Son of God to live with humans in the flesh, to be perfect in every way, to be undone on the cross in our place, to be resurrected on the third day, and to ascend, to be seated at the right hand of your throne. God, all of the story and now the preserving and preaching Holy Spirit of Christ that continues to work the power and miracle of regeneration and applying what Christ paid for according to your purpose. Lord, all of these things come together and include us May we trust you. May we live according to what's to come and not so much by what is today. May we listen for the down payment of the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, his prompting on us. May we, we be willing to suffer in this life so that we could glory in the next. May we be fools for Christ. And may we be found without the diversification of our hope putting it in this and that and others and a little bit in Jesus. But each year, Father, each day, may we put all of our hope in you and hide it in you, for our hope shall be hidden in the Lord. And may we be wise in this generation and be counted among the saints of God who walk in glory at the final judgment when we look back on all of our days with little, little regret. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.